Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. In today's video, I thought it would be interesting for us to take a look at the moments when English monarchs fell afoul of the Pope and thus were forced to run the gauntlet of excommunication. We're going to explore the lead up, the event and the aftermath. But before we take a look at today's topic, I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to History Hit for sponsoring another video on this channel. History Hit brings you the stories that shape the world through their award-winning podcast network and online history channel. It's like Netflix, but all history. With History Hit, you can watch hundreds of hours of original history documentaries anywhere, anytime, on any device. Brought to you by expert historians such as Dan Snow, Professor Susanna Lipscomb, Dan Jones and more. In addition to already having hundreds of expert-led programmes, they add two more every week. History Hit also launch 19 new episodes weekly across eight podcasts, which includes the world's leading history podcast, Dan Snow's History Hit. I really enjoyed watching Treason. In this episode, we accompany Matt Lewis as he takes us through some of the incredible highlights in the National Archives exhibition on this topic. While doing so, he explores the way that the treason laws developed in England. Click the link in my description box to find out more and to subscribe to History Hit. As an added bonus, History Hit are offering my viewers a very special discount. If you use the code Reading the past 30 at checkout, you will get 30% off an annual subscription. Thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video. And now, let's take a look at excommunication and the English monarchy. When Edward the Confessor died at the start of January 1066, it was said that he had, as one of his very last acts, declared that it was his preference that his brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson, should be the one to follow him as King of the English. So far, so good. I mean, I think we're all probably familiar with what takes place later in that year of 1066. What on earth has all of this got to do with an excommunication? Well, according to William, Duke of Normandy, and also according potentially to the commissioner and creators of the Bayeux Tapestry, which isn't a tapestry, but is instead an embroidery, however, that's probably a discussion for another day, promises had been made. Promises that were being broken by this elevation of Harold Godwinson. The exact timeline is obscured, but there are contemporary reports that assert that at the start of the 1050s, the Archbishop of Canterbury had gone to William to inform him that Edward the Confessor had promised that he, William, would be his successor. Indeed, this has even been presented as a solemn oath that Edward the Confessor took. Further to this, one of the manuscripts of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle states that William even visited England and Edward in 1051. It has been assumed that this visit, if indeed it took place, would have offered a key opportunity for these two individuals to confirm those promises about the succession in person. It is also claimed that in the 1060s, Harold Godwinson would find himself in William's presence and possibly quite considerably in his debt. This was following a trip which would see Harold be shipwrecked and then captured by Guy, the Count of Pontou. William, it is said, intervened in order to liberate him. The Bayer Tapestry shows what allegedly happened soon after this moment. Here we are shown Harold as he ceremonially lays his hands upon two reliquies. We are told that at this moment, he is making a solemn oath of fealty to William. He is swearing upon the reliquies. Harold had, it was being claimed, solemnly vowed to serve William and also to support his accession to become King of the English. Additionally, 
The Norman sources would assert that Harold had been crowned by Stigand, who, as far as the papacy was concerned, was illegally holding the title of Archbishop of Canterbury. And this illegal holding had resulted in Stigand being excommunicated by the Pope. And so thus, Harold had seemingly broken a devoutly sworn oath that he had taken, while also being the accessory to another oath being broken, namely the one that Edward the Confessor was said to have made to William about making him his successor. And on top of that, he had allowed himself to be crowned by an excommunicated priest. Against the backdrop of all of this, William sent an envoy to Pope Alexander II to ask that Pope to give his blessing for William to invade England and unseat Harold. Now, there is some debate over just how far this Pope went, but there are many primary and secondary sources that do assert that William did, in fact, receive the Pope's blessing. Some say that the Pope blessed a banner for William to take into battle, to make his conquest holy. In essence, kind of like a crusade. And also that the Pope issued a bull of excommunication against Harold. In the eyes of the Roman Catholic faithful, an excommunication of this kind would nullify Harold's authority and his right to rule. Removing him was thus divinely sanctioned. Unfortunately, William's speedy success at Hastings does mean that we don't get a particularly clear idea of the possible effects and potential repercussions of a king of the English being excommunicated by the Pope. Never fear, though. For all we need to do is fast forward through history to the reign of William's great-grandson, Henry II, because Henry II would certainly feel the effects of excommunication. Real excommunication in the case of those around him and threatened excommunication for himself. Very briefly for now, and perhaps I can make a dedicated video on this particular topic in the future, Henry II had mistakenly believed that if he were to place a servant and friend in the position of the Archbishop of Canterbury, that would, effectively, make the church in England his to command. Unfortunately for the king, he had seemingly underestimated that friend and servant, Thomas Becket, in his capacity for piety. The king tried to bring Becket to heel with accusations and charges. And so, Becket fled into exile. But in doing this, he would prevent any and all of the offices that were traditionally done by the Archbishop of Canterbury alone from being performed in any recognised or official manner. Any of the rites, sacraments and services that were in the gift of the Archbishop of Canterbury to perform, to observe, to witness and to approve, they all grind to a halt in England during his absence. Becket's return to England would be negotiated and ultimately agreed, although it would require some threats going from the Pope to King Henry. Becket celebrated his return to England by excommunicating all of those he deemed to be his enemies in the church. And of course, these enemies in the church are frequently going to be people that were on King Henry's side. King Henry II is not a monarch who has gone down in history remembered for his temperate or measured response to things that disappoint or anger him. He is known to be a monarch with a temper. However, Henry is said to have lost his temper in a quite extraordinary and, as it would turn out, catastrophic way. It is said that he exclaimed, Who will rid me of this turbulent priest? Four of his knights, who heard this exclamation, decided that they would leave Normandy and make their way to Canterbury Cathedral. When they arrived, they found Thomas Becket, and there they would kill him, on the 29th of December, 1170. The act horrified and scandalised all those who learned of it. The clergy of Christendom were understandably outraged. Pope Alexander III was frankly incandescent, and King Henry II was mortified and afraid. At first, Henry locked himself away. A papal interdict was threatened and then ultimately proclaimed against King Henry II. Interdicts bar a person or a group from participating in church services and certain rites. 
And so I think in this way, practically, an interdict is very like an excommunication. However, in the wider terms, in how it's viewed and what it means, an interdict is something that is less severe. Certainly, it seems that Henry was absolutely terrified that his interdict would be upgraded and that he would be excommunicated. Thomas K. Keefe explains that as a mark of this fear, Henry, quote, took measures to prevent papal legates from entering his lands, closing the channel ports behind him when he left the continent for Ireland. Henry wouldn't leave Ireland until 1172, but to get back on track with the Holy See of Rome, this king would need to signal his devout penitence. And so he admitted that although he did not order nor desire the killing of Thomas Becket, his rageful words may have been something that caused it. In a display of public penance, kneeling at the door of the cathedral at Avranches, Henry vowed to remain in obedience to the Pope from then on, to allow appeal to the Pope to reach him, to remove the customs he had enforced upon the church to his detriment, to restore the See of Canterbury, make peace with Becket's supporters, and also to take up the cross to go on crusade or to assist in the reconquest of Spain. However, Henry, despite this resolution that was brought on by his penance, that arguably should have meant that peace was returned to his realm, continued to find himself being beset by conflict both at home and abroad. I mean, after all, his own sons and wife had come out in rebellion against him. And so with all this in mind, is it conceivable looking at this backdrop of rebellion and conflict, that this king continued to think that he was accursed by God. Is it possible that the perception of being accursed by God is what induced this king, on the 12th of July 1174, to walk barefoot to Canterbury, where a shrine to the recently canonised Becket had been set up? Is it possible that this process is what allowed him or permitted him when he arrived there to consent to be stripped and then to spend the night being scourged or whipped by the monks of Canterbury? If King Henry II's youngest son, John, is anything to go by, then falling out with the Pope appears to have been in the bloodline. Ecclesiastical appointment would prove to be the touch paper in this case, And John and the Pope would butt heads on a number of occasions due to this. Who was going to be in the posts in the church in England? When the Pope persuaded the monks of Canterbury to elect an archbishop who John found to be unacceptable and then consecrated that archbishop, John responded by seizing the estates of Canterbury. Once again, Canterbury is proving to be the battleground. John then forced the monks from Canterbury into exile. Pope Innocent III responded by issuing an interdict in March of 1208. This interdict would last for a while. And so, in the example of this and the example of John, we can see that when a king is placed under interdict, so too is the land and the people that he governs. And therefore, the sacraments that were not permitted for the king were also not permitted for his subjects. None of them could partake in the mass, receive extreme unction, or be buried in consecrated ground according to Christian tradition. Indeed, only infant baptism and confession for the dying were allowed to continue on. And so perhaps we might be able to imagine the impact that this falling out between John and the Pope would have had on the day-to-day lives of King John's subjects. However, while, as we have seen, John's father had been cowed, in part at least, by Pope Alexander III doing the same thing to him, not so John, because he doubled down instead and went on to confiscate all clerical property, Only the favoured amongst the clerics would be able to reclaim theirs later. Pope Innocent III in turn responded by excommunicating King John in November 1209. Those that were loyal to the Pope could not do this king or his nation any service. Excommunication is literally referring to the cutting off 
of a person, or in the case of the king, his nation, a whole country from communion with the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And so because of this, leading churchmen had to head into exile. By 1211, seven bishoprics and 17 abbacies sat empty. Had King John been so inclined, which I think we're going to find out for good reason he wasn't in a moment, but had he been so inclined, it would have been very difficult to fill all of these places because papal authority was needed for any of them to have any real authority. However, I don't think John cared that much because all of these seats were still earning money, which in their vacant state went to the king. So although John and his nation were being cut off from the spiritual treasure of being in full and lasting communion with the Holy See of Rome, at least this king was being compensated quite substantially, as it would turn out, in this worldly fashion. Ultimately, though, this sum of money, vast though it undoubtedly was, was still not sufficient to buy King John out of the domestic and foreign threats to his rule that were still ongoing. John's barons were prepared to use extreme violence to get their demands met, and the King of France was threatened to invade, and all of those loyal to the Pope, both in England and abroad, were bound to support these actions and offer absolutely no aid to John. John would finally submit to the Pope so completely that John Gillingham has described it as John's, quote, surrender of the kingdom to the papacy. After nearly six years under papal interdict, in July 1214, it was lifted. If we fast forward to the 16th century, we will meet another parent and child who will find themselves on the receiving end of excommunications, albeit with substantially different outcomes from that we've looked at so far. At various points on the journey of King Henry VIII's so-called great matter, there would be threats of excommunication. They would hang over Henry in England as he refused to set aside Anne Boleyn and take Catherine of Aragon back to him as his true wife. They remained when he denied that he had ever been married to Catherine, when instead he went ahead and married Anne, according to the papacy, in a bigamous fashion. It was there as the monasteries were being dissolved, as the Pope's authority to hear appeals from England was being denied, and as the king demanded the full submission of the English clergy. Indeed, Henry would require clergy and laity alike to recognise Anne Boleyn as his true wife and queen. Elizabeth as his only legitimate heir, and Henry himself as the supreme head of the church in England. All those who refused, including prominent figures like Sir Thomas More and Bishop John Fisher, would be executed as traitors. At first, Pope Clement VII had been the one to be doing much of this threatening. But after his death, on the 25th September 1534, he was replaced by the next Pope, Pope Paul III. And this Pope would continue the threats. He would issue a bull of excommunication against Henry, which would also involve England being placed under an interdict. And this would happen on the 30th of August, 1535. However, the Pope would suspend this motion, quote, in hope of his, meaning Henry's, amendment. This hoped-for amendment would not come. Indeed, King Henry VIII would ramp up. He would have the pilgrimage of grace violently subdued. I do have a video on that, which I will leave linked. And then, in 1538, agents who were working on Henry's behalf, who were tasked with inspecting and, in many cases, destroying shrines, turned their attention to the shrine of Thomas Becket. So we are at a kind of full circle moment here they would tear it down. On the 17th of December, 1538, Pope Paul III reissued the bull of excommunication against Henry VIII. However, the church in England was, I'd say, arguably better placed to weather this particular storm than it ever had been before. 
because the king by this point had made himself head of the church in England and so was essentially already in place of the Pope. On top of this, of course, he had enforced the acceptance of this state of affairs onto his churchmen. Anybody who was still in post and indeed alive had to agree with him, at least outwardly. So Henry might be excommunicated, his nation might be under papal interdict, but I think for the most part, the religious life of Henry's nation and people could roll on unchanged, at least unchanged by papal intervention. Because as we know, Henry could and would mould the character of faith in his nation in whatever manner suited him. After King Henry VIII's death, and the death of the Protestant boy king he left behind him, Henry's eldest surviving child, his daughter Mary, would successfully assert her right to the throne on the 19th of July, 1553. Mary was bound and determined to return her nation into obedience with the Holy See of Rome and to the Pope by any means necessary. And she would, for a time, achieve this. However, after Mary would come her half-sister Elizabeth. She would succeed Mary on the 17th of November, 1558, to become Queen Elizabeth I, and she would walk back her sister's resignation of church control. Elizabeth would be named Supreme Governor of the Church in England. Once again, the Pope would have no authority. But at least at the start of this reign, there was to be a policy of toleration for Roman Catholics in England. Now, toleration is an interesting word. Often, I think it's used almost interchangeably with acceptance, even approval. And this, I think, softens the perception of the situation. If you accept something or someone, you are consenting. You agree to it or them. Perhaps you are even welcoming them in. Elizabeth and her government tolerated Roman Catholics in that they suffered them to remain, to continue to exist. These Roman Catholics would, however, be expected to conform outwardly and attend the state church, lest they be fined. Towards the end of 1569, ill feeling about this state of affairs, and indeed others, would boil over into what has become known as the Northern Uprising, or the Rebellion of the Northern Earls. This rebellion was put down. However, this doesn't seem to have put Pope Pius V off. Instead, it appears that he felt that he could continue to inspire the Roman Catholic faithful to not give up in their quest, or even to rise up further. Because at the start of the next year, 1570, the Pope published the Regnans in Excelsis, which excommunicated Elizabeth. Through doing this, this Pope is announcing that he deems Elizabeth to be unfit to rule. He is saying that she should be deposed and that any Roman Catholic from this point on is freed from any bond of allegiance that they might otherwise have held towards her. Her laws and the laws of the England that was ruled by her were no longer theirs to follow. Arguably, I'd say, all this did was make the lives of Roman Catholics in England more difficult and more dangerous because now even toleration might be a step too far for the government of the day. I mean, after all, if Roman Catholic faith resulted in and was connected to a belief that Elizabeth was not the rightful Queen of England, how could such a thing, such a faith, be suffered to remain? Like her father before her, the actions of the Pope in Rome did not cause Elizabeth to alter the character of her faith in any way, nor did it alter her assertion of her right to govern the Church in England. The papacy's foothold in England would never return to the preeminence that it once held. Indeed, due to the 1689 Bill of Rights and the 1701 Act of Settlement, Roman Catholics, or those married to Roman Catholics, were barred from inheriting the crown. But what do you think? Of the effect of excommunication and or interdict on monarchs across the centuries? What about the potential experience of their subjects? 
And what do you think of the different responses to excommunication that we have seen displayed today by the Angevin kings and then by the Tudors? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video, or you can come and find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box, so please do consider following me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. And if you did, why not share it with your friends? For that matter, if you like my channel, why not tell your friends all about it? If you did like this video, please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. And I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. And I know I say it every week, but I do, whenever I say it, get a comment of someone saying that it inspired them to go and check and they noticed they had been unsubscribed. So now is the perfect time if you think you're subscribed to just go and check. Just pop down, see, make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. And while you are there, checking, subscribing and possibly resubscribing, you will spot there's a bell icon beside the subscribe button. If you hit that bell icon and then select all in the drop down that will appear, allegedly, YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.